Um, we're very, very pleased to have Liz Tinman with us. Um, it is, as you know, next year, the 70th anniversary of the first British nuclear test in Australia. She has written a definitive book about this, and it on the topic that we could possibly have um, speaking here today. And also, of course, because of the recent um, pact between Britain, United States and Australia about nuclear powered submarines, there's a kind of question mark about the whole way that Australia is going at the moment um, that we were just having a brief chat about before. So without further ado, I'll just hand over to Liz. And after Liz has spoken, we'll have Q&A. Vice Chair and we will ask you to put things in chat as well as raise hands to speak, okay? So let's go. Over to you, Lynn. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lynn. And it's a great pleasure to be speaking to you from beautiful Alligator Creek in North Queensland, um, land of Woolgaroo, Gabar and Bindal people. Um, you might be interested to know, you, you very kindly mentioned my book, Atomic Thunder, but um, um, is in production and will be out very soon. It's going to be called Secret of Emu Field, Britain's Forgotten Atomic Tests in Australia. And uh, so I'm burning the midnight oil at the moment, working through the production um, stage. The book is written, it's now in production, ready to, to come out soon. But it's a great pleasure to be able to talk to you about a very important issue for my country and a, an issue that um, I have no doubt is of great your interest. The photo, photograph you see came from my uncle, Uncle Glenn, who was, uh, who was based at Woomera. He got it from a friend who was actually at Maralinga and these are trees at Maralinga. Uh, after one of the atomic tests there. I've always found it a very haunting image. Now, um, let's see if I can move this along, there we go. Um, I went to Maralinga and Emu Field earlier this year in this presentation, were actually taken by my brother who was among the group of people who came with me. Um, Andrew is his name. He took some very good photos, including this one. The name Maralinga is not from the land of the Anangu people. And like most things associated with the atomic tests in Australia, it's a colonial construct. Um, the, the word means thunder, and you've possibly heard that already, and that's the reason why my book is called Atomic Thunder. thunder. It just means thunder, and it came from a language called Garrick which is a now extinct Northern Territory Aboriginal language. The people who spoke it had no say in one of their words being, being taken and used in this context. It was actually applied to the site. The site itself was known as X300, but it, um, the name Maralinga was applied to it by a government committee and specifically by the chief scientist of the Australian Minister, uh, Department of Supply. So, so much about this story is to do with taking from the Aboriginal people of the area, taking from Aboriginal people from other areas as well. And in researching my latest book on Emu Field, I discovered perhaps even more so than the Maralinga story, I discovered the, um, the terrible harm that was caused to the Indigenous people in the vicinity of Emu Field. I will touch upon that later. I pay my respects to Maralinga Jarrachar, um, people, they are the traditional owners. They take their responsibilities very seriously. And I am very privileged that they allowed me and my party into the area, and particularly to Emu Field, which is a restricted area these days. Um, even people who go to Maralinga are generally not allowed to go to Emu Field for various reasons. Now, I just want to... Um, start introducing some of the characters and we don't have much time to talk about them and it's a big 
that you know some of the individuals who are involved. Robert Menzies was um, the Australian Prime Minister who came to power in 1949. Conservative, member of the, the Liberal Party, actually founder of the Liberal Party. And um, he was a noted Anglophile. However, that is not the reason he said yes to Clement Attlee, the British Prime Minister who rang him one day in September 1950 and asked if Australia Britain's nuclear test program. Um, Menzies had a fairly broad range of reasons why he would want to say yes. Um, among those reasons were recently discovered um, uranium deposits at a couple of, of mines in Australia. Um, also, he had security um, concerns, particularly after the Second World War, um, wanted to shore up um, post-war alliances. So that was part of him. Um, and he was initially at least, and for quite a long while, um, quite interested in establishing an, an Australian um, nuclear industry, both energy and weaponry. Of course, that didn't happen, although we, we can now see history starting to repeat a little. Then we've got Lord Cherwell, Frederick Lindemann, um, who was one of the great boosters of uh, atomic energy, scientist known as the prof, very close to Winston Churchill, but in fact quite involved in um, the, the Clement Attlee era as well, um, in, the, in the very secret committees that were involved in um, starting to develop uh, the <laughs> nuclear enterprise in, in the UK. So we have Cherwell standing there next to Lord Portal, um, Portal being the atomic supremo, the, the head of nuclear energy during the um, the post-war era and um, the, um, the infrastructure and, and the capability of the UK in uh, developing uh, its own nuclear weaponry. And of course, Winston Churchill, who came back to power in October 1951 um, and who discovered the extent of development towards a, a UK bomb and was quite pleased with the, um, with the progress. He'd been quite a critic of Clement Attlee, um, thinking that Attlee was moving too slowly, but um, back to power, Churchill gave the political go ahead for the first test in Australia. Ernest Titterton was a British physicist, um, part of the Manhattan Project, very young at the time of the Manhattan Project, but given quite a bit of power, he um, actually triggered the Trinity test. Um, he came, he was recruited to become one of the foundation chairs of physics at the Australian National University. And he became notorious as Australia's Dr. Stray. Believed by many, Mind you, there are some people who defend him, but there are, he's a very controversial figure, Ernest Titterton. Um, many believe that he um, closed off the communication channels between the UK and the Australian government, and therefore the Australian government was largely kept in the dark. He, from 1957 till the 70s, um, headed up the um, Atomic Weapons Test Safety Committee for Australia. Um, blocking role um, between, um, particularly during the Maralinga era, um, between the, uh, the British government and the Australian government. William Penny, um, who is the designer of the British, the early British nuclear weapons, um, part of a, a, an insider, very senior in the Manhattan Project, part of the Br British mission um, that went to, um, to that project and helped develop the bomb considered to be a, a brilliant man. And I, he was um, a mathematical physicist. Um, and I think in his later years, quite conflicted by his role in um, creating and testing the bomb. And then Howard Beale, the Australian Minister for Supply, who um, oversaw the um, test program in Australia from the Australian end, um, was 
pretty much kept in the dark by Menzies and behaved in a fairly sort of way without really looking closely at what he was he was doing. In the end, he fell out with Menzies and it was sent as Australian cabinet ministers who fall out with the Prime Minister often are sent as the ambassador to Washington. So he sort of exited the picture at a certain point, but it was quite important in the setting up of the Maralinga Agreement. That's the early era. There's a later era as well. Um, and I'm very interested in my in, a, in Atomic Thunder in the later era, um, because so much of what happened during it was so secret and the Australian government did not ask many questions. And I think it was you know, criminally negligent in um, allowing tests that almost certainly killed people um, and damaged the environment forever, um, but basically didn't really look closely at, at um, the processes that were going on there. It was later that um, a lot of it, whistleblowers and parliamentarians who were involved in that. Tom Uren was a, a Labor Party um, member, a senior member of the, of the Whitlam government. And he um, started asking some awkward questions in the 1970s about what had actually happened at Maralinga. And some of those questions were very pointed indeed, and they did start to open a bit of a can of worms. Uh, Yami Lester was a child at Emu Field in 1953. Um, he later was completely blind. He became blind over a period of time, um, not the causal link between his being present during the black mist from Totem One um, and his blindness is, is it's a complicated story, but um, almost certainly his health was compromised by the fact that he was exposed to the toxic black mist that arose from Totem One. He became um, an agitator, um, a a pain in the ass to the Australian government and others. Um, he was a, a great person, a great man. Uh, we lost him a couple of years ago, but he did amazing work um, to bring to light the, uh, the legacy of the British nuclear tests. James Killen was the defence minister who tried to keep a lid on everything in the 1980s. He was a member of, the Malcolm, of Malcolm Fraser's Conservative government. Um, and he um, prepared Cabinet, a secret cabinet document, uh, or his department did, um, that um, alerted the Fraser government that the plutonium left on the ground at Maralinga could potentially um, be taken by terrorists and used by terrorists. And that document was leaked to Brian Tuohy, who's also shown there, second to, um, to the right. Um, Brian Chui is one of Australia's, and I was very honoured by the fact that Brian launched my book, um, but he got hold of that, um, that cabinet document and um, it started to blow this whole story open. You can see James McClellan there too, uh, Diamond Jim as he was known, he had been a minister in the Whitlam government, but he later um, went back to the judiciary and he was the chair of the Royal Commission into the nuclear tests in Australia. And Ian Anderson, scientist, and Ian was uh, my mentor and colleague there. His investigative reporting on Maralinga was extremely important in uncovering the true extent of plutonium contamination. <laughs> And I outlined some of that work in my book. Okay, so very broadly, um, there were three different sites. And the first one was the Montebello Islands off the coast of Western Australia, uh, very remote. Of course, the fallout went to inhabited areas. Um, the very first test was in 1952, but the British went back there in 1956. And indeed, in 1956, um, for the Mosaic series, Mosaic G2 was the biggest nuclear weapon exploded in Australia. It's 
um, the exact yield is disputed. Uh, it's at least 60 kilotons. It was a, as much potentially as 98 kilotons. However, it was not it was not a fusion weapon, although some people surmise that it was, but it definitely wasn't. But it was just a really big one. It was part of the um, the push, though, for the fission components of the fusion weapons that were later tested um, at Christmas Island in the Pacific. Emu Field is my real interest right at the moment. Operation Totem in 1953, the first terrestrial test. Um, Back at Montebello in 1952, that was a maritime test um, conducted in the hull of a um, of a ship. But Emu Field was uh, was conducted on land. Maralinga. So there was a gap between Emu Field and Maralinga, and during that time, British priorities fundamentally changed from fission weaponry, which was seen very much as part of the conventional arsenal of um, the country. Um, and it shifted over to the idea of fusion weapons. And so a lot of what happened at Maralinga was connected with the, um, and indeed the 1956 tests at Montebello were connected with um, the, um, the, the hydrogen bomb. That two or several grapple series at Christmas Island. So in Australia, 12 major bombs were exploded, three at Montebello, two at Emu Field, seven at Maralinga. In addition, there were hundreds of so-called minor trials um, that took place mostly at Maralinga. There were some at Emu Field, but the vast majority were at Maralinga and they left a terrible, terrible mess. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. These are the Montebello Islands. You can see they're very low-lying islands um, and they're in a very biodiverse on the Australian coastline. There was a, a biological survey done before the, um, the tests were carried out there and a lot of the samples um, were taken back to the UK. Um, it's since become, that general area of Australia has become um, quite interesting to marine scientists. But uh, back in the early 50s, um, that was not a priority. So here you can see, um, and the one that's off the coast of Tremui Island, 1952, and then the other two, one was on Alpha Island and the other one was actually on Tremui Island, land-based, they were mosaic, but uh, the very first one was the, uh, the maritime test. And there you can see it. Um, a lot of the distinctive look of that test was to do with the fact that a, a very large amount of seawater was lifted up um, with, um, with the bomb. It was exploded in the hull of um, a, uh, a ship called a which was brought out from uh, the UK. That was his Blue Danube design, which was modelled in some ways on the bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki. Um, it had some things in sort of dispersed in this unusual pattern. It was about uh, 25 kilotons, so it was quite a bit bigger than the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. And there was some infrastructure that was built on Montebello, not very much, but uh, it had cars and roads and, and um, sheds and different things like that. And you can see if you were to go there, and not many people do, although um, some people in boats do, but you will see a plinth there that indicates um, where one of the most, this is from the mosaic, one of the mosaic bombs that was exploded from a tower at that point. After the success of Hurricane, and in fact, um, even before Hurricane, they, they knew that they were going to have to test on land as well. They initially wanted the maritime test because um, the UK being a seafaring nation, um, there was, and the Americans hadn't done comparable maritime tests. Um, they were very keen to get that one as their first test, but they knew that they would want um, to test on land and they had a, a 
wide variety of things that they wanted to test. Um, they, William Penny, his preference was to test with the Americans. He was already familiar with their, their sites uh, in Nevada. And of course, they had been developing their sites in the Pacific as well, and, and he would have preferred to work with them. However, the McMahon Act made that impossible. Um, and the McMahon Act was brought in in the wake of the various spike scandals, but particularly um, Alan Nunn May in 1946, who had been a, a junior member of the Manhattan Project, uh, had been uncovered as a spy. Um, so the Americans fairly opportunistically, because really they wanted to um, monopolise the technology, um, they introduced the McMahon Act that made it illegal to um, uh, cooperate with other nations on nuclear weapons development. So, but even so, the British still felt that they probably would eventually be able to um, work again with the Americans. And even in the lead up to Hurricane, they were still hoping that they would be able to. Um, but then um, Klaus Fuchs, the atomic spy, was uncovered in about 1950. And uh, that put an end to that, at least for the time being. They did, um, the McMahon Act, or parts of it anyway, were repealed in the late 50s. But in the meantime, they had to find somewhere for a terrestrial site. They weren't necessarily going to test in Australia. They tried all sorts of different places. Um, but in the end, it did make a kind of sense because they were already testing their rockets at Woomera. So there was already a restricted area the warmer prohibited area, which took up a large part of South Australia. And the person who surveyed both Woomera and Maralinga, and indeed MU Field, was Len Bedell, who was a, uh, a renowned Australian bushman surveyor, um, who made quite a bit later of his exploits. Um, he became quite a raconteur in his later years, but initially, of course, um, his work was very secret. Um, and he um, surveyed the area and also built a lot of the roads that ran through the atomic test sites and through the rocket test sites as well. On our way to EMU, and it's only about 200 kilometres between Maralinga and EMU Field, EMU is to the north of Maralinga, um, but it takes six hours to drive there, so you can imagine the roads. Halfway there, at the halfway point, you'll find this tree, and it's called Lens Tree. And on that plaque, it just indicates how many miles back to Maralinga and forward to Emu Field. Um, and we stopped there and had a cup of tea um, at that tree. <laughs> uh, it was a very long day, but it was uh, extraordinary. And look at the beautiful country, the red, the red sand, the mulga scrub, the bright dome of the sky. It's the most beautiful country you've ever seen. I fell in love with it. And I felt very, very angry and very sad knowing what had happened to that area. This is the um, vivid, iridescent, almost clay pan. This is why Emu Field was chosen as a site. This is a completely flat, natural clay pan, and it was possible to land aircraft on the clay pan. And so Len Bedell, with a, a small party of other people, found this clay pan and they brought Land Rovers in and put the headlights on and pointed the Land Rovers at the, um, at the clay pan and then a, an aircraft was able to be guided in by the lights from the Land Rover. And that aircraft carried William Penny. And he had a look at the site that, um, that Len Bedell had found and declared that it would be suitable for the terrestrial tests that he had planned his Blue Danube device. And this is me at the clay pan looking at um, the, the natural water that was coming up through the clay. Uh, I found it absolutely fascinating. And there's still some old relics. It, Emu Field was never properly cleaned up. But you see junk everywhere at Emu Field. It was just basically left, including the contamination and all the, the radioactive glass that was formed by the atomic bombs. Uh, just left there, very little done in the way of cleanup. This uh, is, to me, a really um, striking image. I remember very well when I was standing on the lookout. So Emu Field is a very flat place. 
but there is a small rise um, called the lookout and we stood up there and looked out and you can just see um, there's a road that heads off into the distance that heads off to ground zero for uh, one of the totem bombs there were two bombs in the totem series and that road leads to one of them and then um, in the other direction so it became a sort of triangle uh, in the other direction was was the site for totem two so I spent quite a bit of time contemplating what that must have been like in October 1953 when Operation Totem took place. So William Penny um, went to EMU shortly before Totem 1. There he is there in his suit and tie in the middle of the desert. Um, there was a small party. Um, EMU Field only ever had, um, it, it was limited by the water they only ever had 300 people there at any given time, as opposed to Maralinga, which had thousands. In fact, about 35,000 people lived or stayed at Maralinga during its time that it was operational. Emu Field was much smaller. At the Royal Commission, Penny was asked, in the planning stage, did you harbour concerns in relation to the fact that the fallout from those totem tests would necessarily pass across a significant part of continental Australia? Penny answered, they would pass around the world. They knew. That photo is courtesy of um, Stephen Hogevin, whose uncle was part of the Royal Australian Air Force um, team that built the site at Emu Field. And I will talk in my new book about... Um, Stephen Hogevin's uncle, David Bailey, and his deathbed confession, in which he, and it's unfortunately not able to be proved through documents, but he said that after Totem 1, he was ordered to retrieve the bodies of some Aboriginal people who were killed in the blast and, and told to bury them. Now, I can't, as an historian, I can't verify that account, um, but it rings true with the level of detail that um, Stephen Hogan, who I've spoken to as part of my research, uh, it certainly rings true. It would not surprise me at all. There was very little concern for the welfare of Aboriginal people who lived all around the site. Now, they you might had... need to up your pace just a little, sorry. I don't want to rush you, but maybe could you maybe just up your pace just a little, sorry. I will. I'll get on to Maralinga now. Um, so that's dawn at Maralinga. Um, it's the most beautiful place, but it looks to me a little like a nuclear weapon on the horizon there. <laughs> um, this is the village at the time of the tests. Um, that's all been pretty much dismantled now. And those buildings were used elsewhere. They were taken to other parts of Australia and used. Walter McDougall was one of the few white people who was um, able to, uh, or attempted to help the Aboriginal people. Um, but it was a doomed effort. He had to cover 100,000 square kilometres and try and keep Aboriginal people away. Um, and of course, that was impossible, but he did his best. He was quite a noble person in many ways. There's um, a, uh, a serviceman who was there, um, Quite a striking image. This image always chills me. This is the atomic bombing of Australia. Um, Buffalo 3, the Buffalo series held in 1956, uh, a Blue Danube bomb was dropped from a V bomber over Maralinga and exploded. Um, that's the only airdrop. The others were uh, either on towers or on the ground or from balloons. I won't dwell upon the minor trials other than to say that um, there was a fair amount of fancy footwork that the British government and the weapons authorities, including this fellow Bryant from um, the Atomic Weapons Research Establishment, um, to um, try and get around the um, moratorium that had come in in 1958, and also to justify detonating the minor trials, which were non-nuclear explosions, but still involved nuclear um, materials tried to get around um, 
conducting those trials in the UK. They could have been done there. In fact, Scotland was mentioned as a place where they might have been done. But uh, in the end, um, it was decided that uh, Australia really didn't matter and they would be conducted in Australia. And Brian Tui, the investigative journalist, did a lot of good work on this. He said it would seem that what the British and Australian authorities described as minor experiments, in fact, involved the cavalier dispersal of plutonium and have created a far greater health hazard at Maralinga than the full scale atomic tests. They left a great deal of plutonium there, as was finally discovered by um, the um, Royal Commission and what came after. Um, about 20 kilograms of plutonium-239 was left on the open range of Maryland. Avon Hudson was a RAAF um, young fellow who was at Maralinga in the early 60s, who is still to this day a ferocious whistleblower um, who did a great deal to bring um, this issue to people's attention. That's what the Maralinga airfield looks like today. And that's what the swimming pool looks like. It's been filled in, but they had a cinema and a swimming pool and a church and they had all kinds of things. It was quite a village um, and lots of people lived there and apparently they really liked the food and, and the conditions generally, perhaps not realising how exposed they were to the, um, to the fallout. Uh, Taranaki is where most of the Vixen B minor trial contamination was to be found and that was the focus of a very expensive cleanup that was that took place, most of which was paid for by the Australian government, although the British government did contribute grudgingly and took years of negotiation, but did finally contribute something towards it. Um, Taranaki is probably one of the most contaminated places on the planet. And so that was from the era of the cleanup, that um, image. That's me at Roadside. Roadside was the start of the Ford area. Uh, so there was the village, then a, about a 40 kilometer drive to the Ford area where the tests actually took place. And that's what the village looks like today because it's now a tourist destination, believe it or not. Uh, it's also the subject, you know, the, the tests generally are the subject of quite a bit of Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal art. And uh, this is an example from an exhibition I was involved in called Black Mist Burnt Country which toured Australia a few years ago. And that's also one of the images from Black Mist, Burnt Country. And that's my book. And there'll be another cover to show you in probably in a couple of weeks time. So I'm sorry that I ran over time, but uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs>